Allora, buongiorno a tutti e benvenuti. Grazie di essere qui. Credo che possiamo cominciare con uh, questo corso. Io faccio solo una breve premessa, prima di tutto a nome di tutto il comitato organizzatore, tra cui abbiamo qui la professoressa Marino e il, il suo squizzato, e poi arriveranno anche gli altri colleghi. Eh, lascerò alla fine di questo corso tutti i vari riconoscimenti, ringraziamenti, patrocini vari e descrizione di come il corso è stato organizzato. Oggi partiremo in maniera molto pratica, spero cercando di essere subito molto concreti. Una precisazione prima di iniziare, i due, le due lingue ufficiali di questo corso abbiamo deciso fossero eh, l'italiano e l'inglese. Abbiamo anche alcuni partecipanti che vengono dal, dall'estero, quindi ogni docente sceglierà autonomamente se tenere le proprie eh, lezioni, le proprie presentazioni in inglese o in italiano, io personalmente ho preparato il mio materiale didattico prevalentemente in inglese e farò alcune presentazioni in inglese e alcune in italiano. Stamattina per partire comincerò utilizzando come lingua ufficiale l'inglese, eh, così almeno cerchiamo di includere tutti. And so, I will start again and welcome to everyone and thank you to everyone for being here. Uh, I'm very pleased to open this uh, course uh, which is dedicated on Uh, to research integrity and uh, the responsible conduct of research and uh, the aim of uh, my lecture, of my uh, presentation is just to try to show you why and which were the reasons why we decided uh, to develop a course like this uh, dedicated uh, uh, to this topic which to the best of our knowledge, uh, I think it's the first experience of this uh, kind uh, in, uh, in Italy and uh, not in Europe, of course, but uh, in Italy for, uh, for sure. And so my presentation is uh, dedicated, it opens the first uh, module of this uh, course, uh, which is dedicated in, to the general topic of research integrity. And the title specifically is Research Integrity. What is it and why should we care about it, of course? Because I think that uh, most of us are not so um, familiar with a lot of uh, concepts. And uh, I was the first one when uh, I mm, came in touch with these topics to ask to myself why I should care about research integrity. I'm doing research in a lot of years and I think that I do maybe not excellent, but quite good research. I, I know my work and some people uh, told me what I, what I should do. So why I'm supposed, uh, or everyone should be supposed to take care about all these topics. And uh, basically, these are the points that I will mm, present you, that I will uh, discuss. Uh, first of all, uh, um, some elements to understand and to, that it will be possible to uh, discuss uh, uh, whether we are actually facing uh, a scientific research crisis, that is, uh, some possible crisis of the uh, system, of the very organization of scientific research, in particular in the biomedical field. And second, I will try to give you some uh, uh, basic definitions uh, which uh, are related to the, the topic of research integrity, what we mean by research integrity, by scientific misconduct, by questionable research practices. And then I will speak a few, very few, of course, this, this is not my specific field, but about statistics, which is a friend of four, or an agony and ecstasy in, in, uh, in experimental research in particular. It's a very powerful instrument, but uh, it's, uh, it, uh, it's uh, is also vulnerable to uh, a lot of misuses. And uh, finally, i will just give some hint about why it is important for everyone to adhere to ethical norms in, in research. And the recommended references are, are mostly uh, the material which you already found in the kit uh, which you received when you registered. And uh, we try to collect the main uh, documents, also practical documents and guidelines uh, which uh, uh, relate to research integrity presently, uh, I think, in some way uh, worldwide. So, first of all, is there actually uh, worldwide a scientific research crisis? Uh, this is a very nice uh, study which was published, uh, which, which is still in press, I think, or is going to, to be published. It was published on the web recently. 
which just uh, uh, defines uh, the, the words of scientific research in terms uh, of the uh, number of publications, which are increasingly uh, a lot over the last uh, 30 or, or 35 years. And here you can see basically the rise of publications uh, uh, from 1980 uh, uh, up to a couple of years ago. As you, as you know, we, we, are, uh, we, we usually consider the publications the main outcome of scientific research since publication is, uh, from the point of view of the researcher, the, the um, final aim. Uh, okay, now uh, a lot of people uh, speak about also patents uh, and uh, spin-offs and mm, stuff like this, but uh, I still think that publication is the first purpose of the researcher just because uh, uh, we do scientific research just to increase uh, the, the knowledge uh, of society and to grant the progress and the welfare of society. And you see that according to this uh, model, these researchers show that over the last decades, the increase in publications worldwide, we are speaking about all the publications, not only in biomedicine, just follow an exponential growth. So this means that a lot of publications, I mean hundreds of thousands every year are, are uh, published. So it's apparently a lot of knowledge. And these publications arise also from, uh, in, some, in some way it's possible also to say that there is a, uh, all these publications depend on a, a very uh, strong and intricate network on, of uh, uh, relationships between researchers uh, uh, and all the researchers are ba base their work on the results, on previous results of other researchers, as also shown by the increasing number of citations. This graph shows the citations over time. In this case, the time is very much because it considers all the documents uh, uh, that these researchers could retrieve in, uh, in very large databases, just dating back many centuries ago. But just to show, they also show a very interesting uh, trend, that is that also the number of citations is, is in some way follows an exponential uh, uh, growth model, but which is increasingly and increasingly steeper and steeper. So it means in some way that over the last few years, uh, uh, about the, the, the second part of the last uh, century, uh, researchers, uh, um, in some way uh, need to be uh, increasingly confident on the work of previous researchers. So it just means that an increasing number of studies is cited by each individual study, as shown by the uh, steeper and steeper increase of the number of citations over, over uh, time. A few more data just to show how big is now the, the deal of scientific research worldwide. On the left, you can see a graph showing uh, uh, the research outputs in terms of publications, not, uh, not patents, but just publications in, the, in science and, uh, and engineering that is uh, nearly all the, 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 um, the world of scientific research. In the last uh, about 15 years, these are data from the National Science Board that you can easily find also on the web. And you can see just divided uh, by the uh, European Union, United States. You see, for instance, that European Union in 2011 just uh, published about, uh, uh, this is in thousands, so it's 250 thousands of papers, only in European Union and only in 2011. And on the right panel, Ma questo lo faccio in italiano. Ma questo lo faccio in italiano. No, no, io la mia Ferrari l'ho fatta riportare, l'ho fatta riportare nel box dall'autista, vi pazienza, dopo che sono stato alla cena di, di autofinanziamento. Eh? No, e invece c'è da spostare una macchina che è una Mercedes eh, parcheggiata davanti all'ingresso. Quindi se qualcuno è il proprietario... Eh. Non è, di non è di nessuno, la può essere utilizzata anche questa come autofinanziamento. So I was saying a great deal of, of uh, activity as shown uh, on the left panel uh, in terms of numbers of publications per year, 
I mean, a lot of publication. We speak, uh, 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 but it's possible to speak about nearly uh, millions of publications per, uh, per year. And on the right side, in terms of people who do research, I mean, researchers, this is just, uh, uh, it should be tenured researchers in the various uh, uh, areas of the world. But you see, for instance, in 2011, in the European, 2010-2011, uh, in the European Union, we have still in thousand, it means 1 million point five thousands of, uh, of researchers, about the same in the United States. China is growing very uh, fast, and this should be a separated topic, maybe also in some way of concern. So there are also millions of people dealing with scientific research. That is a great enterprise. I think that for the whole society, as, as it should be worldwide. And in the left uh, lower corner of this slide, I just put a very uh, recent uh, uh, paper which was published on the European Journal of Clinical Investigation with just using a, a citation database, which we will discuss later in this, uh, in this course. Some researchers show, show that uh, uh, over the last, uh, let's say, mm, uh, in, in, a, in a time period of about 15 years, from 1996 to, to 2000, and, and 11, they were able to retrieve. This is only in the biomedical field, uh, uh, more than 25 million scientific papers which were authored overall by 15 million people. So of course, 15 million authors, of course, not just tenure researchers, but authors, but it just means that people who are involved uh, in scientific research. So of course, it's a great deal. It's a great enterprise, maybe the greatest one which the, 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 I think that maybe it's possible to say without so much rhetoric that the humankind is involved uh, in and on which is based the progress of knowledge, which in, in turn, of course, it, it, it is supposed to grant the progress of society, of techniques, uh, of uh, welfare, uh, of health, because we are speaking about biomedicine. But but there is some caveat because, uh, in particular, over the last few years, uh, some signal of alarm is beginning to uh, appear, in particular in the scientific literature. For instance, I am a medical pharmacologist, so I decided to start from this aspect of the, of the story. It's a few decades that we are experiencing what we can call a kind of uh, uh, crisis uh, in the development of new drugs. Uh, this is a well-known phenomenon. So in in my opinion, it is not only a matter of, uh, uh, um, I mean, scientific research. It's possibly, uh, from my point of view, uh, first of all, maybe a matter of how the, the pharmaceutical industry just developed uh, and uh, the, the methodology uh, upon which the pharmaceutical industry is based, uh, the, for instance, the recent discipline about patents and something like this. But in any case, it's, it's absolutely true that uh, there is a crisis in the development of new drugs. And one of the factors, one of the major factors on that, that which is involved, which contributes to this, uh, to this uh, crisis, is in some, uh, in some way uh, a very, an increasing uh, difficulty in translating uh, results from basic research into uh, clinical development. And as you see in this, uh, in this study, this is a letter, a letter which was uh, published uh, three years ago in Nature Reviews Drug Discovery, which maybe most of you know as a, as a leading journal in the, in the field of uh, drug uh, development. Uh, um, this is an analysis uh, of um, the success rates for the development of new projects in the, in the second phase of clinical uh, research over uh, a few years, and uh, here researchers say that uh, the success rate fell very much for t from 28% to 18%, which is nearly uh, half, uh, um, half of the, of the percentage of success rate. And the reason for failure has been identified, as you, as you see uh, in the lower part of the slide, that uh, uh, about in uh, more than half of the cases, Possibly the reason for failure was due to insufficient efficacy, which these researchers interpret, first of all, in, the, in a very big problem in translating basic research into uh, clinical studies. So what does, what does it mean, insufficient efficacy? Maybe it can be in, in some way a, a, a clue that uh, 
basic research maybe was not so strong, so provided results not so strong and not that they could be translated easily into uh, clinical uh, uh, evidence. And on this basis, uh, this is another paper. Uh, now I will show you three or four of the main papers which are usually cited just to show um, in some way which is uh, the apparent uh, uh, crisis uh, in particular in, biome in biomedical research which is increasingly affecting, uh, uh, I would like to say also the trust uh, which we can uh, assign to biomedical research. This is a, a, a letter, another letter in Nature Review Drug Discovery which was published in 2011 and this is a letter uh, coming from uh, researchers working in, uh, in Bayern uh, in um, the pharmaceutical industry Bayer in Germany. And these researchers uh, uh, decided to do um, a check in their lab in the preclinical division of Bayer, just selecting uh, uh, several uh, um, papers uh, and studies, preclinical studies which were already published and trying to check if results were reproducible just to select possible uh, programs uh, for further development, uh, uh, for further industrial development towards the development, of course, of new drugs. And as you see what they say, we received input from 23 scientists and collected data from 76 projects, most of them for December from the field of oncology. In this first cake, you can, you can see that uh, the, the main, uh, the most of these projects were from the field of oncology. Some of these projects for, were from uh, um, cardiovascular research and some also related to women's health. And they tried to replicate the, 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 the core results of these uh, studies which were already published. Uh, and, uh, but they found that only in 20, 25 percent of the projects they could uh, reproduce in-house uh, uh, the results of the studies. In almost two thirds of the projects, there were inconsistencies with the published data and in house data uh, to the point that uh, finally the evidence that they could obtain uh, repeating experiments uh, in the laboratory was not enough to justify further investment into this project. So, uh, what does it mean? Another point of view, this is just a, a, a similar kind of work, uh, which is in, uh, in this case research, uh, researchers from Amgen, maybe some of you know uh, about this, uh, this bi biotechnology industry, it is the, maybe it's the largest biotechnology industry in, uh, worldwide. And uh, Amgen um, uh, tried to do uh, nearly the same. They just selected uh, uh, some uh, seminal studies, uh, more than 15 stu that 50 studies in the field of oncology and dermatology, and tried to reproduce the results. They had nearly the same uh, result, that is more than two-thirds of the studies were not uh, reproducible, but they also uh, analyzed uh, uh, first as you, as you can see from this table, first, the journals on which the studies were published. Uh, usually we tend to think that uh, uh, high-level top journals uh, should be more accountable for what they publish. And also the number of citations that these studies were receiving, the number of citations were taken as a proxy for the impact that these studies had on uh, uh, subsequent research. I mean, if a researcher is uh, citing a study, it means that the study was influential for, for her or his uh, uh, work. And as you see, in the third column of this table is the, the mean number of citations for non-reproduced article, that is studies for which the results could not be uh, reproduced. And in the last column, the mean number of citations for reproduced article, the, uh, for studies for which the results could be reproduced. In the first line, uh, studies published in journal with high impact factor, more than 20, the ones to, uh, of you who are familiar with impact factor, you know that more than 20 is absolutely a top or fashion scientific journal, and between 5 and 19, so in any case very good journals or journals that we usually consider very good from the scientific point of view. And you see that the number of, uh, of uh, citations that this paper receive uh, is very high 
and uh, quite the same, independent from the possibility, let's say, the quality of the results which are presented, uh, uh, the quality as described by the possibility to replicate these results. So even non-reproducible results are quite influential on uh, subsequent results. This is the take-home message of this, of this letter. And this is another evidence, maybe the, the last one which I would like to show you, but there is much more literature on, on the topic. In this case, uh, um, these are researchers from the Amyotrophic Lateral Sclerosis Institute in, uh, in uh, the United States, which is the main uh, not-for-profit institution uh, uh, which is dedicated to the research uh, on uh, ALS. Uh, and they decided to select uh, uh, some seminal studies uh, uh, regarding uh, treatments for uh, ALS, uh, which were performed in animal models and which were published uh, with some good results. I mean, just describing uh, uh, the positive effects of some drugs, of some, some drugs on uh, uh, mortality and viability in these animal models of, of this uh, uh, tragical disease. And they found absolutely no evidence. They replicated in the same animal models, and they found absolutely no evidence of efficacy for any of seven uh, different uh, uh, drug treatments, including a lot of very popular treatments, which are also widely studied in clinical, like Rilosol, for instance, like lithium, uh, like and so uh, um, very critical drugs uh, uh, for which also a lot of investments uh, are presently put on preclinical and clinical research. But we found absolutely no evidence of efficacy, and they also put forward some possible explanations. So, it's possible to say that there is some concern about the quality and about, in particular, the key word is uh, reproducibility of published results, uh, uh, in particular from preclinical research. I will spend a few words later on, on uh, clinical, uh, on the, on the, in the lecture of this afternoon about clinical research, but the, the main concern and maybe the novelty uh, of this year say that there is uh, much concern that we can put on preclinical research. And as I told you, the key word is reproducibility. Are results which are published reproducible or not? I mean, if they are reproducible, we can be confident and we can, be, we can work just based on this kind of results. Otherwise, it's a lot of waste of time, of researchers, of energy, etc. And just to say that this concern is growing also in the institutions. For instance, this is a very recent uh, um, consultation uh, which uh, the United States government just launched this uh, summer, as we usually do, public consultation, which is published on the World Wide Web, so any one of, of you also can participate if you, if you would like, strategy for American uh, in innovation. And one of the key points about science, technology, and research and development priorities as you see, regards exactly reproducibility of preclinical research. Given recent evidence of, of the irreproducibility of a surprising number of public scientific findings, how can the federal government leverage its role as a significant funder of scientific research to most effectively address the problem? So, I mean, this is the United States government which asks for, for suggestions and to develop a strategy in this regard. And the NIH, National Institutes of Health that, as you, you know very well, this institution in the United, uh, in the United States, which uh, is the, maybe the main institution which uh, develops, promotes, and also supports by means of a lot of grants, biomedical research, not only in the United States but worldwide, already began to, to try to put into action some, uh, some remedies. Uh, and uh, this is a, a position paper, an editorial, which uh, some NIH representatives published in Nature uh, this year, where they announced that, as you see, as a funding agency, the NIH is deeply concerned about the problem of reproducibility of results, in particular in preclinical research. And they are uh, convinced in some way that one of the main factors is poor training of researchers. Poor training is probably responsible for at least some of the challenges, so the NIH is developing a training module on enhancing reproducibility and transparency of research findings with an emphasis on good experimental design. All of these concepts have, uh, has to do 
with uh, research integrity and responsible research. And so uh, just to say that a lot of people worldwide uh, are just uh, uh, increasingly looking uh, at good and systematic training of researchers, not just experience of the field, but systematic training of, uh, of researchers on the methodology of uh, research, uh, just with the concept that uh, uh, it is only a uh, good, strong and rigorous methodology which makes good and, let's say, also ethical biomedical uh, research. And just a few additional hints, just to say that in any case, this topic of uh, uh, problems of quality and reproducibility of preclinical research also provides some, has presents some specific and, and uh, very interesting characteristics. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, maybe some of you are familiar with some bias uh, in clinical research. Uh, mo most of us uh, uh, know very well that clinical research can be biased by a lot of factors, in particular, for instance, from the pressures uh, deriving from people who uh, finance, who sponsor clinical research and uh, a very a very well-known phenomenon is the fact that uh, uh, clinical trials are usually more favorable to, uh, for instance, clinical trials of drugs are usually more favorable in results um, concerning the experimental drug when the trial is sponsored by a pharmaceutical uh, industry. So usually we look with, with, with a few concern uh, to trials uh, which are not independent and uh, in which the role of pharmaceutical industry is very strong. But, for instance, this is a, a recent meta-analysis which was performed by the group of Lisa Bero, uh, which uh, uh, who at the time was in, uh, still in the United States, and showing a quite surprising finding. They, they uh, analyzed uh, uh, several studies, 49 animal studies, estimated the effect of statins of on ather atherosclerosis risk. You know, statins are, are uh, let's say, a blockbuster uh, uh, drug for cardiovascular uh, uh, disease with a lot of investment and a lot of interest. Uh, and uh, um, they decided to do a meta-analysis that is uh, a uh, collective analysis of several uh, uh, studies which were performed, but in, pre uh, in the preclinical setting in animal models uh, uh, looking at possible sources of heterogeneity for the results of these studies. And the main finding is this one, which is highlighted in, in red in this quite complicated uh, figure, which just shows that, uh, su quite surprisingly, uh, in the preclinical setting, the studies which provided the best results were not the studies which were directly sponsored or, or uh, performed by industry, but were the studies which were performed uh, in uh, the university setting, the academic setting. So where usually you are supposed to find independent researchers with, who should be supposed to be more, I mean, not so affected by, by some pressure to find successful results. But the interpretation is that, and possibly it's, it's quite likely, the interpretation is that possibly in the preclinical setting, Industrial researchers are much more concerned in finding strong results which might um, justify investment of money for the clinical development, while in the academic setting, researchers are much more concerned with finding results which can be published and which can be published uh, in top-level journals. And top-level journals we will see in the, in, uh, in, in, uh, further lectures also during this course, the top-level journals uh, increasingly seek for novelty, for unexpected results, for, uh, uh, I mean, breaking through results, absolutely surprising results which can uh, attract very much the, the attention. Just because also the uh, most scientific journal, in particular at the top level, uh, would like to have more and more uh, readers. And so possibly also academic researchers are also pressed uh, in finding uh, uh, exceptional results uh, uh, also for reasons uh, related to their careers. So it's, it's a little bit uh, complicated uh, um, picture. And finally, this is a, a study which was published a couple of years uh, ago and which is still presently very much discussed uh, because uh, it provided uh, a strong evidence that uh, um, this is from uh, uh, a different point of view. 
The study described the phenomenon of a retraction of publications. What is a retraction? In, the, in, the, in a scientific journal, if, even if a paper is published, but in case some elements arise later after publication that results shown, shown in that paper are, uh, uh, cannot be trusted, the journal can decide to retract the paper. Or also the authors can decide to retract the paper, maybe saying which is the reason, maybe just not saying which is the reason. In some cases, maybe when you perform some, some uh, bibliographic uh, research, you will find some paper uh, in which there is the note, this paper was retracted, and maybe also with some reason. And these researchers just uh, um, analyzed uh, um, the, two, the, the, the about 2,000 papers that in some decades uh, uh, they, they could retrieve from PubMed that were retracted over about the last, uh, let's say, 40 years, 1977 to 2011. Uh, and, and they found, you can see from these graphs, uh, that first uh, uh, lower panel, the number of retractions increase, increase exponentially. And second, the reasons for retractions are, first of all, reasons related to fraud or reasons related to plagiarism. That these are uh, among the main uh, scientific misconducts, we will see. Or reasons re uh, related to some uh, error, errors, more or less genuine uh, errors. Someone can say that we are speaking about uh, a very few fraction of the total number of publications worldwide. It is 2,000 publications retracted uh, over about 40 years uh, in comparison to millions of publications. This is true, of course. But just think that it is the tip of the iceberg. And, uh, and uh, um, for instance, consider that retractions occur uh, most often in top-level journals. So why? Maybe because on top-level journals, research cannot be trusted so much. Or possibly maybe because top-level journals uh, have a better system to uh, uh, identify uh, things that are not absolutely good. Or just possibly because on top-level journals, only top-level research is published and usually attracts much more attention. And so attracting much more attention is easier to identify potential problems. But in any case, this is a fact. I mean, this exponential increase of uh, retractions, which are mainly due to what we will call scientific misconduct. So what we will call scientific misconduct? And uh, now it's time to, uh, to, to um, provide some definition uh, what we are speaking about when we speak about research integrity and or scientific misconduct. So first of all, definition of research integrity. Definition is possible uh, to, to, to give from different points of view. The first one, for instance, is this one provided by Stanley Korenman from the NIH, uh, who is the author of, uh, of a well-known and renowned manual about uh, uh, responsible conductor research in the preclinic and in particular in the clinical setting, teaching the responsible conductor research in, uh, in uh, humans, uh, uh, published in 2006, and uh, uh, Stanley Coleman is a researcher at the University of California in Los Angeles. And for him, you see, research integrity may be defined as active adherence to ethical principles uh, uh, in, and professional standards essential for the responsible practice of research. I will emphasize professional standards. I mean, are the high and rigorous professional standards which allow the adherence to ethical principles. This means, as you see, honesty in proposing, performing, and reporting research, accuracy and fairness in representing contributors, contributions to research proposals and reports, proficiency and fairness in peer review, collegiality in scientific interaction, disclosure of conflict of interest, protection of human subjects, and human care of animals, adherence to mutual responsibility of mentors and trainees. So ultimately, research integrity means examining the data with objectivity and being guided by the results rather than by preconceived notions. Of course, all of this has to do, it's possible to say, okay, need to be honest. This is not the right answer in, in our opinion. 
to be honest in this regard, uh, need to be professional. That is, need to have uh, a very strong methodological preparation. And this is another uh, definition by the NIH, usually in the United States, they are very pragmatic. So what is research integrity is adherence to uh, values in scientific research, honesty, accuracy, efficiency, objectivity in every aspect of uh, research. Maybe it's easier to understand about scientific research that's looking uh, at the other side of the medal. So uh, what is a, a breach of uh, scientific, uh, uh, of uh, research integrity? It is what we call research misconduct, or in Italian, cattiva condotta scientifica. Hmm? There are three main, uh, uh, let's say, the three deadly sins, uh, i tre peccati mortali. Uh, in, in uh, scientific research, which can be defined, uh, uh, fully defined as research misconduct. That is fabrication or falsification of data and plagiarism. Plagiarism maybe is the, not, not, not the, the main one, just because plagiarism is a copy or of someone else's work, as you see. It's the appropriation of another person's idea, processes, results, words, without giving appropriate credit. There are different forms of plagiarism, but I, I will not go through this because I think it's not the, the critical point uh, for this course. Uh, fabrication and falsification of data is of much more concern. Fabrication is just what is called also dry labbing. Uh, dry labbing because in, in, uh, in biology and medicine, you see usually we speak about these areas as wet sciences, scienze umide, scienze bagnate, because we deal with biological systems, and dry labbing is just to do research uh, wi without, uh, without humid, without water. So it means just sitting at the desktop uh, and, uh, and uh, fabricating data, making up results and recording or reporting uh, them. While falsification of data, which maybe is the most, uh, uh, is the, 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 the is of the most concern is manipulating research material, equipment, or processes, changing or omitting data or results, such as the research is not accurately represented in the research record. Falsification of data is much more common than anyone could uh, think about it. There will be a lot of um, there could be a lot of examples, but uh, I will be more detailed in this uh, uh, afternoon uh, presentation about uh, uh, examples of major uh, uh, breaching of scientific integrity. So I will go a little bit faster on these uh, slides, just because I would like to spend a few more time uh, about other type of misconduct, which are usually not uh, considered uh, major uh, scientific misconduct, so not so deadly scenes, uh, which usually, for instance, according to the, 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 the rules which are in, in, in act, for instance, in the United States, they are not prosecuted, but which maybe are playing a major role in this uh, very big problem of irreproducibility of research, in particular in the preclinical setting. And uh, uh, from this point, I, I will follow mainly the consensus report of the Organization for, uh, for Economic and uh, um, cooperation uh, development, which you have in your, uh, in your kit, so you can find all these references in these uh, documents, in particular in the document which is entitled Best Practices for Ensuring Scientific Integrity and Preventing Misconduct, which is a, a working uh, uh, paper which was developed a few years ago and which still now represents one, one of the most advanced uh, papers uh, on, the, on the topic. And they classify uh, what is possible to call questionable research practices, not true research misconduct, but questionable research practices, discutibili pratiche di ricerca, um, practices related to the research itself, to the managing of data, to the publication, and some other misconducts, including financial misconduct and also personal misconduct. Just some examples. Research pressing misconduct, for instance, using inappropriate research methods, but also harmful of dangerous research methods. Some one lecture in this course will be also dedicated to the safety in the laboratories. I mean, uh, um, scientific misconduct can also imply harm, direct harm to researchers, but also poor research design, and this has to do 
with the, ch the, 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 the choice of the experimental model, but also with statistics. We will deal a few with statistics in the, in the next uh, part of this presentation. Experimental analytical computational errors, violation of human subject protocols. Uh, we will provide some examples in this regard, and also abuse of laboratory animals. What are data-related misconduct? For instance, non-preserving primary data. How possible to check for the quality of data if you not preserve the experimental data that you obtain in your research? Uh, bad data management, bad data storage, or withholding data from the scientific community. What does it mean? For instance, when you decide, uh, when we decide not to publish results which we don't like, usually, in particular in the in the clinical setting now. It's a little bit, I think, it's possible to say that it's established that uh, any kind of results should be published because we involve uh, human subjects. So we have also an ethical obligation in regard to these subjects. And step by step, uh, now there is increasing consciousness that the results from clinical research need always to be published. But in the preclinical research, if we just performed studies on some mice, and results are not so nice, and it's very, or maybe they are negative results, and it's very difficult to have these results accepted as a study in some good journal. So why waste, waste time uh, uh, trying to submit and submit and submit some results which had nearly no interest? But of course these are experiments, these are results, uh, and if they are not published, uh, it means that maybe, for instance, someone else will try to develop the same research and waste time and waste resources. And also these, these studies were performed with some resources and, and this kind of, of uh, consideration. Publication-related misconduct, claiming undeserved authorship, the, the issue of authorship, in particular in the biomedical research is critical, uh, or denying authorship to contributors. It's the two phases of authorship. It's the uh, ghost or guest authorship, I mean, for instance, giving authorship to the director. Why not? But he did nothing in this study. Not how possible to deny authorship to, to, to him or to give authorship to some influential researcher which later could support me. Or just denying authorship to people who participated, students, PhD students, just who had maybe practical role but that, uh, that are not so influential. So denying authorship. Or also artificially proliferating publications. Maybe we have just a lot of data. Oh, so why putting this data in only one publication? I can have two, three, or four publications. It will be good for my record of publication. It will be good for my career. It will be good for university. It will be good for a lot of people. But of course, it's not honest, and maybe it can also result in a distorted presentation of the results. Financial misconduct, Finan financial and other misconduct. Uh, so uh, about financial misconduct, for instance, misuse of research funds. You have funds for a project, and you decide to do different project. Or peer review abuse, misrepresenting credentials of publication records. Uh, I think that we will speak about this when we will uh, uh, speak uh, in, the, in the module which is dedicated to scientific publication. Or also making malicious or unsubstantiated allegations of misconduct towards some other colleague. Accusare anche altre persone di una cattiva uh, condotta senza uh, fondamento, semplicemente per danneggiarle, semplicemente per eh, anche questo. What is personal misconduct? For instance, inappropriate personal behavior, but also, and this is very important, in particular for senior researchers, inadequate leadership, mentoring, counseling of students, and insensitivity to social or cultural norms. So what we are speaking about, I mean, in theory, it's possible to understand now that there is a lot of possible uh, questionable uh, behaviors. But are we speaking about uh, a substantial problem or not? In other terms, it's possible to, to uh, provide some information about the frequency of this kind of, uh, of uh, behavior. So someone tried to do this. For instance, this is... Uh, um, very uh, often cited uh, work, which was published in Nature in 2005, and it's a very big 
survey of some thousand uh, uh, researchers world, uh, worldwide, I think researchers that were in some way connected with the NIH. And uh, by means of, uh, of an anonymous questionnaire, all these researchers, more than 3,000 researchers, were asked to report uh, in their opinion how frequently they were involved in some questionable behavior. And as you see, I reported here the main results. For six of the behavior reported frequencies are under 2%. So it's not so much, but it means under 2%, it means for instance that in, 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 in this room at least a couple of people maybe should, uh, it's possible that were involved in some questionable um, behavior. But under 2% uh, were, for instance, falsification and plagiarism, which are very serious uh, uh, misconduct. But you see, for instance, overall, 33% of the respondents say that they had engaged in at least one of the top 10 behaviors which are all included in questionable research practices during the previous three years, 33%. So, I mean, one in, in, in three. And uh, maybe of even, most, of even more concern, among mid-career respondents, the proportion was 38% in comparison to the early career group in which the proportion was 28%, so a 10% difference between senior researchers and young researchers. But of course, the problem is that young researchers at present are expected to learn from senior researchers. And how possible to interpret this data? Maybe also in terms that young researchers are a little bit more worried about what they can do and senior researchers step by step we are more and more confidential that okay of course something is possible to do no one will look at what we do in our lab so why not we will have maybe some good papers we can continue in this in this uh, in this regard this is more or less the same figures uh, which were also found in some more formal analysis of literature on this topic and this is the most important paper in this regard it was published in 2009 on plus one by uh, Daniele Fanelli, who will also a uh, speaker in this, in this uh, course uh, on next Friday. He will speak exactly about these uh, topics, which is his main area of research, and that presently he is, it's possible to say that he's the main and the most influential researcher worldwide on this uh, topic, and this is the most cited paper in this, um, in this uh, regard, because he did a meta-analysis of uh, uh, all the studies which were available at that time on scientific, on the frequency of scientific mis misconduct, uh, and these are more or less his main uh, conclusions. Uh, you see, a pooled weighted average was 1.97%, by 2% of scientists admitted to fa fabricated, falsified, or modified data, but up to 33% admitted other questionable result practices. But additional reasons for, for uh, concern, and it's possible to smile a few. In surveys asking about the behavior of colleagues, uh, admission rates were 14% for falsification and up to 72% for question and research practices. So, of course, we always think that we are good, more or less, but colleagues, of course, the fault is always on colleagues. It's colleagues who do not work good. I would work very good. Unfortunately, this university cannot do good research because I have a lot of questionable colleagues, of course. <laughs> And also, this is very interesting, in particular from my personal point of view, misconduct was reported more frequently by medical and pharmacological researchers. So what does it mean? That medicine and in particular pharmacology are among the most questionable areas of research, or maybe that in these areas there is much more sensitivity about, uh, the, the, about scientific integrity and questionable research practices. And finally, the conclusion of Daniele Fanelli is that, of course, uh, since all these surveys was uh, based uh, on spontaneous reporting, it's possible to say that these estimates are conservative of the pr true prevalence of scientific misconduct. Statistics. Why statistics? Just because possibly statistics is among the critical points related to the methodology that we use in, in research. Usually, most of us, uh, and, uh, and uh, of course I include, all, I, I include first of all myself, uh, have uh, very few preparation in statistics. Uh, uh, we usually do statistics by use of uh, automated softwares uh, or when statistics is much more complicated, uh, we ask the help of some 
statistician is the best of the in the best of the situations but but a lot of problems may may arise of course this is a paper which was published in 2005 by a worldwide renowned epidemiologist uh, who is John uh, Ioannidis uh, working in, uh, in Stanford uh, and uh, it was very provocative and it presently is, is still the most cited paper which was published in Plus Medicine and you see the title is Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. So it was very strong in, in, uh, in his, uh, his, very strong in his position. And he says, as you see, a research finding is less likely to be true when the studies conducted are smaller. So it has to do with research design and with statistical analysis. When effect sizes are smaller, when we see just a few, I mean, our results uh, uh, show just a few uh, size in the, in the dimension of the results that we, that we obtain. When there is a greater number, a lesser preselection of test relationships, that is, for instance, when you decide about relationships, when we have results, when we have data, and then we ask ourselves, okay, how now will I analyze this data? Hmm? When there is greater flexibility in design, definitions, outcomes, analytical modes, when there is greater financial and other interest and prejudice, when more teams are involved in scientific field in chase of statistical significance. So most of these reasons are related to statistics and some of these reasons are, are also related to conflict of interest and to competition. And one question could be, is competition good for research? Simulations show that for most study design and settings, it is more likely for a research claim to be false than true. Of course, a lot of discussion about this. Some years later, in 2008, again, John Ioannidis was, a little, was uh, uh, again very, uh, I mean, critical and destructive on this point. I would like to say very provocative, like a physician who provides a true diagnosis, even, even if this diagnosis is uh, very worrisome. Why most discovered true associations are inflated? I mean, associations, for instance, in, in uh, epidemiological study. He is basically an, uh, an epidemiologist. And he provides a lot of advices in this paper, in, uh, in these tables which are reported here. I would like uh, just to emphasize the content of table four on, uh, four on the right. He provides just a, a differential profile of uh, the aggressive discoverer in comparison to the reflective replicator, as he calls, and of course he's in favor of the reflective replicator. What matters is discovery for the aggressive discoverer, but is replication, the reproducibility of results for the reflective replicator. Databases are private, maybe they are public commodity, they should be shared at least with the scientific community. A good epidemiologist, I could say a good researcher, can think of more exploratory analysis, or maybe it's better if is robust about design and analysis plan. What should report what is interesting? Maybe one should report everything that he did. Publication mode. Publish the more as you can. Publish, publish, publish. This so-called salami publications, slices of salami. Or better, publish everything in a single paper to provide uh, the whole picture. And after reporting, push your finding forward, just continue, or be critical and cautious about what you, what you did. I think that there are very good, very good suggestions. And finally, just this year, again, John Ioannidis published a, a more constructive paper. The title is How to Make More Published Research True again in Plus Medicine, and he provides a lot, of, uh, a lot of suggestions for research practice that should improve the quality of research. For instance, large-scale collaborative research, adoption of replication culture, just check about reproducibility, registration of studies, protocols, analysis code, data sets. What does it mean, registration? It means independently from publication, Register in advance the study protocol. Just say in advance what you are going to do. This is a practice which now over the last, let's say, 10 years, 10, 15 years, has been increasingly established in the clinical setting, at least for uh, drug uh, trials. 
but in the preclin in preclinical research, no one thinks about this, and uh, I think that everyone, and I, I, I would be with them, if anyone would ask me at present, just please register your, your uh, protocol, I would ask, but why? It's a waste of time. Why, why I should write a protocol and register? It's very difficult, it's very, but it's critical. I think that it's a critical, it's a critical point. Uh, the sharing of data, nearly no one at present shares data, but it's very interesting that some journals, step by step, are increasingly asking not only for the final publication, but also for the raw data. Hmm? Reproducibility practices, of course, containment of conflict sponsors and authors, the, con the conflict of interest. We, we have a lecture specifically about the conflict of interest. It's very, very important. The more appropriate statistical methods, the standardization, the definition and analysis, etc., etc. And about the statistical methods, another paper which I recommend to all, to all of you is a paper which was published just some weeks ago at the same time in several pharmacological journals uh, and which is just dedicated to statistics. The author of this paper is uh, uh, Harvey Motulski, who is the, the also the developer of one of the most uh, used uh, uh, statistical software in, in biomedical research, that is GraphPad. And uh, it's a very nice paper because it's very practical, very easy to, to follow, and uh, um, in some way also very funny because uh, uh, Motulski proposes that uh, uh, what, we, what we do usually in, uh, in biomedical research, uh, in particular in preclinical research, maybe also in clinical re research, is to do a form of p-hacking. You know, the hacker. A p hacking is just exactly a behavior which follows uh, this kind of flowchart. As you see from this flowchart, first begin the research, obtain data, analyze data. Is p minus 0 0.05? Fine. If yes, publish. Not important. What is data? Not important. If excited, not important. Nothing. It is statistically significant. So publish. It's not minus 0 0.05. So, a lot of possibility to p-hack. For instance, and please think about how many times uh, uh, all of us performed, and me too, of course, because a lot of people usually think that is uh, ac actually honest. These practices. Repeat to increase sample size. Okay, I did these experiments five times. Maybe need to do seven. Maybe need to do eight or ten times. But there is very good explanation just to say that in this way you will inflate your, your statistical significance. Or analyze only a subset of the data. Or include more variables in the model. Or adjust data, for instance, normalize, divide by body weight, transform the data in logarithms. There are some statistical tests which justify this uh, practice. Remove the outliers. When I was a PhD student, if, even when <laughs> I was a student just working for my, for my thesis for the graduation in medicine. This was exactly what I was told by my mentors. I mean, you do an, an in vitro experiment maybe five or six times, statistics is a few weeks, okay, remove the outliers. The important is that the average will be the same. You understand that it's not so, not so fair, uh, but Pick a different group to use as control, compare different outcomes, use different statistical tests. Who knows about uh, students' the test, paired, unpaired, uh, Wilcoxon, uh, uh, NOVA, one way, two way, who knows about it? The, 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 the most important is that finally we obtain a, 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 a significant p value. Huh? Uh, what Harvey Motulski does in this paper is just to comment about the common misconception about data analysis and statistics. These are the five most common misconceptions which he identifies uh, and provides a lot, of, uh, a lot of advice on these uh, misconceptions. Uh, and uh, uh, I will just show one example, but I, I recommend uh, the, the, to read very carefully, to study very carefully this uh, paper. For instance, you see the presentation of the data, how data can be just presented, which uh, uh, these different presentations uh, uh, are all about the same set of data. So which of the data you would prefer, of course, usually I think I dare to say that uh, 
we are quite conditioned to prefer the, I mean, the extreme right. Very low variability. In this case, we decided to put the average value with the standard error of the mean. Very small variability, but the data are exactly the same. But of course, on the extreme left, this is the most informative way to show the data. And uh, the, exactly the uh, with the average and with all the individual data. We should step by step uh, understand that the more is better and the more we are informative, the more we help uh, the other researchers and provide most uh, information about, uh, about our work. Uh, and uh, the final misconception that uh, Motuski comments about is that you do not need to report the details and of course the advices are completely in the different uh, direction. You need to report the details to allow people to understand what you did. Maybe also to criticize. Uh, I mean, critic will be useful. If work is honest, critics maybe will just improve your work and help uh, all the other researchers to do a better uh, research. Hmm? Last point, and after I think I will finish this, uh, this initial, uh, this opening lecture. So why it is important to adhere to ethical norms in the research? I don't want to be too much uh, uh, rhetoric in this, uh, in this way, but I would like to provide some, some hints, just that uh, uh, it, will be possible, it will be possible to understand that uh, um, Following ethical uh, rules and research, I mean just doing what we can call responsible uh, research, finally is of benefit for everyone and most of all for the researcher himself or herself. Hmm? Different points of view about uh, uh, why we should, uh, we should do responsible research. Different points of view. So first of all, this, uh, from this consensus report about best practices in, uh, in research, the negative impact of research misconduct. Of course, it, it's, mm, it has multiple uh, aspects. First of all, it's possible to provide harm to individuals and to society if not good research results and the result of an unsafe product of, or process. It's possible to say that it's not the direct responsibility of the researcher to develop, for instance, a new drug. There are regulatory agencies, but also it's unethical to impose to regulatory uh, agencies uh, an excessive burden, burden of work just because our work was not so uh, good, was not so affordable uh, for, to support uh, this, this possible uh, uh, improvement, for instance, this possible new medicine direct damage to science itself by creating false leads for other scientists. We saw in, uh, in uh, the previous example about uh, uh, papers that uh, show non-reproducible results that nonetheless receive uh, a lot of citations that is, are read and used as basis for their research by a lot of researchers, exactly in the same way as papers which contain reproducible results. So this is a waste of time, a waste of effort, a waste of money, a waste of energy by, by uh, researchers. And in this aspect, a lot of people say, okay, but as we know, science can do mistakes and science, the scientific method is uh, in, in some way uh, self-correcting. I will I produce a study, this study is wrong. Okay, people step by step will understand and will show that my study is wrong and my study will be forgotten. But where is the problem? The problem is that on one side this is a waste of time, money, resources, and on the other side is that this process is true, it's established, but it's also very slow, very slow. And at present, I think that the present uh, system of scientific research cannot afford so much time to non-reproducible, non-affordable uh, uh, results and, uh, and, uh, and studies. The degradation of relations among scientists, uh, between senior researchers and students, etc., damage to science through the undermining of public trust in science. We uh, spoke in the beginning about uh, 
the role of science in society and all, all, all of us, uh, I think that we are convinced that science re uh, results, evidence provided by, by scientific research is the basis of our way of life, uh, is the basis, for instance, uh, for uh, uh, political decisions in the, in the area of health, environment, just think about global warming, or in the, in the area of energy, national security, food, just think about uh, uh, genetically modified organisms and uh, topics like this. But science needs uh, uh, to be authoritative, need, to, need, need that people perceive that they can trust on science. So this is the responsibility not only of researchers, also of institutions, also of a lot of people, but of course scientific misconduct, religious misconduct, undermines the public trust in, in, uh, in science. This is another point of view, it's the point of view of the NIH, very pragmatic. On Second, because resources rely on public support. You need to work too to continuously obtain public support, even if this is a few, a few complicated story, but just, just say this. You need to rely on public support, public investments of voluntary participation in experiments, for instance, the people uh, who you enroll in clinical, in clinical studies. The public relies on scientific problems to, to bet the, the, uh, the lives of everyone the public could actually be harmed by researchers who are dishonest. And we will see this afternoon a very good example in this, uh, a very good practical example in this, uh, in this uh, regard. This is a little bit uh, a bioethical point of view. I will just mention this, uh, and maybe Professor Picozzi in his lectures uh, will, uh, will uh, develop more these concepts. It's a bioethical point of view just because the Professor uh, Reznik is a bioethicist working in the, in the NIH uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, a paper of, uh, of him published on the, on the web and it's entitled What is Ethics in Research and Why is it Important? You see, first, norms to promote the aims of research such as knowledge, truth, avoidance of error. Second, research often involves cooperation and coordination among different peoples and uh, Adhering to the ethical standards promotes uh, the collaborative work and uh, uh, reciprocal uh, trust, uh, accountability, etc. Ethical norms help to ensure that researchers can be accountable to the public, help to build public support when people, for instance, are asked to donate for research. Uh, why they donate? for research on cancer, on multiple sclerosis, on uh, cardiovascular disease, on genetic disease. They donate just because they think that they can trust on science. And so it's very, very important to, to preserve this, this uh, trust. And many norms of research also promote other important moral and social values, such as social responsibility, human rights, animal welfare. We will have some lectures dedicated also to animals in, in, uh, in science, I mean, Animals use at experimental models, not researchers that behave not so good. Compliance with the law, health, and safety. Safety also in, in the labs. So, and finally, just uh, to reconnect to one of the starting points that also uh, led to the development of this course. Uh, uh, this is what, uh, together with Professor Picozzi, we wrote some, some time ago in a, in a letter uh, which was published on the BMJ. Doctoral students in particular and postdoctoral researchers should be trained in research methods and ethics, but I mean in the, in the, in the way which I, I tried to present uh, this morning, that ethics uh, uh, means to perform good and honest research as based on uh, um, a very high and rigorous professional profile. In research methods and ethics and avoiding questionable research practice will primarily result in better results and more scope of scientific and personal achievement. So I mean from a practical point of view, this is possible to say that it's a specific aspect of the general dogma that says uh, that it's easier to be uh, honest, to tell the truth, than to, uh, to lie. 
Just because if you lie, you need to remember what you told. And e e every time need to remember and not to contradict with yourself. If you are just honest and tell the truth, it's absolutely easier because you can just tell the truth. And it's the same as research. If you do good research, if you obtain good results, you can continue very confident and you not need to continuously cheat. This is the point. The recommended references, I told you about them, you can find in your, uh, in your uh, kit. And I would like to end uh, this, uh, this presentation just mentioning some, some citations from, uh, uh, um, I mean, a Twitter hashtag uh, which was very popular, uh, which was very popular, at least, at least in the scientific research field, uh, which was named overly honest methods. And it was an hashtag in which some researchers sent uh, very, very funny, uh, I mean, descriptions of their uh, methods, which in my opinion, in, in some way, provide an, uh, it's possible to smile, but uh, uh, it's possible also to sing because many of these, uh, of these uh, practices sometimes we also face in our labs. For instance, you see, experiment was repeated until we had three statistically significant similar results and we could discard the outliers. But I told you about discarding the outliers. Error bars represent standard error of the mean rather than two standard deviations as it looks significant that way. Or we made a sort of comparison of all post hoc tests when, while our statistician wasn't looking. And there should have been more experiments, but our funding ran out. And so we decided to publish anyway. And the final one, which I, I like most, experimental results are reproducible on Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that uh, the aim of this course, we hope, uh, is also to make in some way results reproducible, not only on Thursday, but possibly all the week, including the weekend. So thank you very much for your attention. So I think, uh, I think there is place for some question, if you like. Possono farlo in italiano? Franca Tolt, possono farlo in italiano la domanda? Grazie. <laughs> Prego. Well, uh, I don't know. <laughs> no, you are absolutely right. But uh, uh, during, during this course, we will have specific lectures, for instance, on publication bias. Uh, we will have specific lectures on several biases affecting, uh, affecting uh, the system of research, or in particular the editorial system. We will have some uh, um, lectures uh, about the process of, uh, of uh, publication. 
And in several lectures, we will continue to insist uh, on the, the, the damage uh, which is doing to research uh, this pressure derived from the publish or perish uh, dogma. It's a serious problem, of course, uh, and, uh, and, and it's true. At present, there is no specific uh, and unique uh, uh, answer, unless that uh, it's increasingly important to work uh, on uh, uh, the topics uh, of uh, uh, responsible research. And just to understand, for instance, as regards the scientific journals, uh, what scientific journals became over the last decades, just because, for instance, also scientific journals have a lot of financial interest. So, um, okay, I, I don't want now to take so much time because we are just on time, but for instance, in the last, uh, uh, the latest uh, uh, paper by uh, John Ioannidis that I showed you, uh, there was also this uh, table that I recommend uh, to, to all of you, in which he tries to identify all the figures which are involved uh, in the scientific research system. That is, of course, not only researchers, not only academia, not only industry, funders, editors, publishers of, of, uh, of uh, journals, uh, hospitals, health systems, uh, and he shows, he tries to show, that the profile of interest in research results, publishable, fundable, translatable, profitable, are quite different, are quite different. So these are all figures uh, which are involved in scientific research, but with different interests and so with different priorities. And it's also very important to work, to work on this, of course, to develop uh, a system, uh, in particular in biomedical research, which will be more and more uh, affordable. Maybe we have time for one more question? Or maybe no, okay, thank you very much. And so I think that we can immediately continue to the second lecture, but <laughs>